Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Richard, for your kind introduction. And let's commence my lecture. So, today we'll be talking about how modern science unravels the secrets of the ancient world. And the reason as to why I picked this lecture is because a few months ago, Scott and I were discussing potential lecture ideas. And I didn't want to be too far in the clouds with physics. And obviously, British Online Society is revolved around cultural development and awareness between Britain and Oman. So, without further ado, let's begin the lecture. So, I thought the best way to start the lecture would be staring the audience with a lot of probably very complicated physics equations. So, I want to start off by saying this is not what physics is. Physics is asking fundamental questions like, why do I have a shadow? Why does the sun rise and set? Why do the planets revolve around the sun? And then we come up with all these complicated equations just to explain those ideas. And the problem is, when you think of physics, I do not want you to think of all of this. I want you to think of a question and the simplest way to answer. Usually the simplest way to answer a question is in a mathematical form because you have different kinds of mathematical relations with different variables and they're all changing. I hope I didn't lose you guys yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so our story starts off with, yeah. so our story starts off in um, ancient Greece during the times of Democritus and Aristotle. So Democritus was the first person that proposed the idea that matter, everything around us, was made of tiny indivisible particles. And although not a lot of his work is preserved, and we'll explore why later, Aristotle believed everything was made of fire, water, air, and earth. And he greatly discredited the work of Democritus for his initial atomic theory, actually. And, and we had Aristotle come up with something called the organ, which is the first scientific method essentially known to mankind. And it, I would say to us now, it's quite primitive because we've developed so much over the past two millennia. Um, Francis Bacon comes in, who was the Chancellor of the British Empire during James III and James I, and proposes a new scientific method called the Novum Organ. And he essentially uh, proposes a new scientific method. And this, I believe, was one of the things that actually sparked the Renaissance era and scientific enlightenment. It's also important to note that um, many of the scholars, researchers, and uh, philosophers uh, from the times of ancient Greece up until probably the first millennia really, really, really stuck through with Aristotle. I mean, the church, I believe in Greece, uh, would call Aristotle the philosopher, not the Greek philosopher, not the most famous philosopher in ancient Greece, just the Greek philosopher. Although he was very famous for his work in politics, political philosophy, and rhetoric, which I'm sure some of you have read and found very interesting. His scientific methods did not hold at all. So we can go on to the next one. So um, after Francis Bacon released uh, Novum Organum and uh, we've catalyzed and revolutionized uh, the world with the Renaissance era, where we've made a lot of openings, for example, uh, the openings of the Alde of Calais, Johannes Kepler, and so forth. We start with John Dalton, who um, essentially the, discovered that things are made of atoms experimentally. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. J.J. Poulton uh, made the discovery of the electron, and Rutherford made the discovery of um, essentially that the electron was not morphed in with the uh, atomic nucleus, and James Chadwick discovered the neutron. And Niels Bohr was one of the first people to propose a primitive model of the um, atom. Um, I think it was this slide actually. 
Uh, so John Dalton's experiment was he was experimenting with nitric oxide and oxygen, and he had noticed um, that uh, nitric oxide reacted with the exact volume of oxygen. And then he had noticed that when he put more oxygen, it reacted with exactly twice the amount. And so he was like, okay, this is interesting. What does this mean, right? This is the scientific question. What does this mean? What can I deduce and conclude from my experiment? And he essentially says everything is made out of matter, uh, everything is made out of um, chemical combinations of different types of atoms. And um, yeah, so for example, if you take a glass of water, I was thinking, do I have a glass of water here or no? So if you take a glass of water, <laughs> um, it's made of dehydrogen oxide. So you have two. Um, atoms of hydrogen and you have one atom of oxygen. Essentially, if you take a glass of water, one ninth of it is going to be oxygen. Eight ninths of it is going to be hydrogen. And no matter how much you divide through it, you're always going to have that relation. And I believe in chemistry, you call that soy geometry. So, so that was the discovery of um, Dalton. We haven't had any uh, big discovery for over a century, actually, after his discovery of the atoms. And now we go to J.J. Coulson. And he was experimenting with a cathode ray tube. Uh, how many of you have done this in a level of physics? Yeah? So you, you understand a bit about it, right? Um, essentially, he uh, had a cathode ray going through here. And he had a very high voltage induced. And he had noticed, depending on the um, uh, voltage he applies on the system, the deflection changes. I actually conducted this experiment in first year. Um, so he concluded there is something that um, is not accounted for by the current uh, atomic theory, something that has a charge, and it deflects depending on the voltage um, applied to the system. We now know this to be the electron. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. Uh, so he also proposes a pump pudding uh, analogy where he, how many of you have tried pump pudding? <laughs> so he essentially says the positive charges and negative charges are all more together into not a pump pudding, but an atom. And his students were quite smart. And one of his students was Ernest Rutherford, who was a New Zealander. And he conducted an experiment where he placed a gold foil and a uh, fluorescent screen around it. And he essentially directed a um, alpha particle beam at the gold foil. And what he was expecting is that all of them would pass through and hit the screen over there. But one in approximately 8,000 times, he noticed that they would deflect completely. And this is because um, you have the charged particles in the nucleus, protons, and they would essentially deflect the um, uh, alpha particles back into the screen. So he essentially knew that the nucleus and the uh, um, electron are not more together. There is a lot of space in matter. And I believe you know how much space is, there is in an atom, right? So the nucleus in the center is like a P. And the atom itself, for example, is like a whole football field, you know? So we're essentially empty space. But next slide. So then we have James Chadwick who discovered the neutron. What he did, he had a plutonium source. Go, wait. Are you all focusing on me? So he had a plutonium source and he directed it towards the beryllium um, uh, sheet and paraffin sheet. What he had, the problem was they could not account for the mass of the nucleus with just the protons. There had to be something else in there to account for the mass, right? So essentially, um, he would produce neutrons here, 
and um, when he would induce a um, electric field, he would notice that these um, produced particles do not deflect up or down. And then when he would also induce a magnetic field, it would also not go up or down or deflect in any way. So we now know this to be the neutron, and we're going to talk a lot about neutrons tonight. So then. then we have Niels Bohr, who was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics. And I'm sure that you, you are going to have a lot of quantum mechanics questions. Um, so what he suggested is the planetary model of atoms. So you have the nucleus sent at the center, and you have the electrons orbiting around. Although this is true for very simple atoms like hydrogen, it's not true for others. And for the physics fans here, this is because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and you can't accurately predict the location and momentum of an electron at a specific point because of the wave parts of the and all that. So, um, but we still use it in school because it's the easiest way to explain an atom to you know children. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into nuance, but if an electron is a fundamental particle, neutrons and protons are not. They are made up of quarks. So we have the quarks here. This is supposed to be there. <laughs> so um, a proton is made out of three quarks, which is uh, two of quarks. Each one has a charge of two over three. And then we and then we have one down quark, which essentially you do four over three minus one over three, and you get three over three, which is one, and that's also charge. And a neutron is made up of one up uh, quark and two down. They have very strange names, so you have up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. A muon is a fundamental particle as well. Think of it as the long lost cousin of an electron. It's 200 times heavier than an electron, but it has the same charge. And we also produce them as oxygen and neutron source. We'll get into that in a moment. This is a neutron fuel source. So this is Rao, who was the Red Apple from the laboratory, and this is Isis neutron and neon source. Uh, Isis neutron and neon source was initially not a neutron or nuclear installation source, but it became that in 1984. Uh, it initially only had one target station, which it's quite hard to see on the map. It was this one, which was opened by Margaret Thatcher in 1984. Um, we produce neutrons and neons here. And this is part of station two where a few of the trustees actually came by last week before his excellency's lecture. And um, they really loved it. Uh, anyway. So this is more of a 2D map and I'll get very technical now. So we produce the protons here and we accelerate it to 85% of the speed of light. And speed of light is the fastest speed known to mankind. Um, we evolve it around 10,000 times. And then we direct the protons either into target station two or target station one. 
So the photons follow a path here, and they have a little carbon um, target here, which produces muons, and then, oh, sorry, here, and it produces muons, and you have muon uh, instruments here. Then you have another target here, which salivates neutrons, and that's what we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, target station two primarily focuses on, or actually fully focuses on neutrons only. So you have the neutrons coming in, and they hit a tungsten target, which is probably the size of a Coca-Cola can, and it causes a lot of neutrons to spallate in different directions. And then we strategically place um, different uh, instruments all around it, and then we use that to study the whole thing. So by a lot of things, what do I mean? Uh, the applications of studying things with neutrons are really wide. It's important to add that they're not damaging. I know many of you are like, what well, is it to ionizing or anything? So the problem is not the problem, the solution actually. Um, a neutron has a lot of mass. So when it actually hits the atomic nucleus, it doesn't damage it because it's not fast enough. If it is damaging, then it might get absorbed and the reaction might occur. Um, some applications include, we've done work with Airbus, Tesla, and Intel, and the previous slide. We have an instrument here. This one. It's called Chip IR. It's the next one. And what we do is we place the computer chips that you probably have in your computer over there. Uh, we place it in a sample inside the instrument and we bombard it with a lot of neutrons and we see how long it takes to essentially disintegrate it, you know. Um, and also the radiation inside that instrument is approximately, I think within a few seconds, it models how long it will take you to like orbit around um, 100 years, something like that. Um, so um, the first archaeological of today um, is prosthetic stones. This they discovered a grave site in um, central Sudan it's called Al Khidai. Uh, it's about twenty kilometers south uh, south of uh, Al Khartoum, and um, they discovered about one hundred forty four. Um, bodies in there are skeletons ranging from the pre Mesolithic era up until um, the Neolithic era. And they discovered a very interesting skeleton. Uh, it's believed to be a male, um, an elderly male. And, uh, they discovered a few pebble like objects and pelvic regions. Initially, what they thought it was well, potentially like kidney stones something like that, um, but they use neutrons to discover the other two cells. Um, if we go on to the next slide. So there were three stones that were discovered. One of them was accidentally broken, and they used that one to put into the neutron source, into one of the neutrons, in one of the neutron instruments. Uh, we have Ines, which is Italian national uh, experimental station, and they used a very complicated technique called uh, time of flight neutron diffraction, which is a very big one. But essentially, when they do that, they get something like this, and this graph tells us what it's actually made up of. So here you have counts. So essentially, how many times a neutron hit an element of, for example, or, um, a mineral like appetite or with log or calcite. And on this axis, we have two theta or uh, scattering angle. And essentially, this, this demonstrated to us that it wasn't in fact a kidney stone because, first of all, its location was in the lower pelvic region. And uh, what we discovered and what we learned was that it's not a modern day disease, it's affected people from. 12,000 BCE, you know. Um, this was personally my favorite one, but I know there is no person in the audience <laughs> that really likes lizards, and they found this study very fascinating. So they discovered these 
uh, statues in uh, in specific sites in ancient Egypt. And I don't know how many of you in the audience found Egyptology very interesting. Yeah. So I know many of you know that it was a poly a poly polytheistic religion, so there were lots of gods, and they would go to the temples and they would give offerings, right? So to one of the gods, they would offer these lizard statues. And obviously, this is an artifact. We don't want to go and smash it apart and be like, is there a uh, mummy inside, right? We can't do that. Um, although they found about several hundred boxes, we still want to preserve them as best as possible. And they're currently at the British Museum. Uh, what they did is they used neutrons to pick up some so we used X-ray CT and we got this image. It's not that clear, right, compared to this one here. It's more clear because the neutron doesn't interact with the electron cloud because it's uncharged, right? So it can actually hit the nucleus and we can tell what element it is, where the X-ray interacts with the um, electron cloud and it produces a very cloudy image. And essentially we can see Something in here, there's something in here. If we go through the studies. So here's our x ray scan. This is, by the way, there are lead boxes. Um, you can see there is some kind of like, you know, body in there. And um, we can see the corrosion there, for example, which would not be visible to the naked eye, obviously, if you don't break it apart, you know, smash it. And if you don't use, um, X-rays because X-rays the purpose the image produces something again really cloudy and not clear. Um, if it goes to the next slide, we did something called um, X-ray tomography, and essentially what it does is how many of you have ever broken a bone? Yeah, and you know how you go to the hospital and you get an X-ray image produced of your bone. What X-ray tomography essentially is is that they Scatter, they put they place a sample here, and then you have neutrons coming in from a specific side, and then you capture an image. You rotate it again, you capture it again, you rotate it again, you capture another image, you rotate it again, and you do it over and over and over. And that what the what that allows us to do is postulate a um three-dimensional image as we see here, and we can see a skeletal vein here, you know. So this, in fact, was a, a real um, offering, you know, because sometimes they would sell actually empty mummies uh, to people to go and get. So they would put stuff like papers inside the mummy and people would still go and offer it and they wouldn't know that it's empty. So basically, we can tell with physics who got scouted who did it. Yeah, so this is a big image of one of the um, one of the uh, lizard statues. Um, you know, if you want to see it, I highly recommend going. To, oh, it's actually a video. Sorry, you could say it. Was that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we do in your um, I mean, if you want to watch it again. <laughs> uh, this is available on the ISO Science and Heritage website. But essentially, uh, this is like reverse engineering. And Dr. Antonella, she really helped me with understanding a lot of the abstract uh, physics ideas behind studying with them. Uh, she said, this is reverse engineering. People put it together maybe 5,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, 500 years ago. And then what they do is they use these neutrons and new ones. 
and they managed to see inside it, you know? It's something so fascinating and extraordinary, you know? It's like, essentially, if you want to go to eBay and buy like a mystery box, you can just send it to ISIS, you probably go to our section, see what's inside it with all the things. <laughs> oh, there's like. So, um, this study was also very interesting. Um, I know I have quite a few people who love politics and the of the crowd. So I think this would be the most interesting to you. So I'm sure you've heard of Nero, Emperor Nero. He was quite probably the most notorious Roman ruler. So essentially Nero was not a good ruler. He had gone to over at 30 and he was subjected to actually suicide which was funny because um, he subjected one of his wives, second wife actually, to suicide. Um, and this was a way of execution. And obviously it's much harder to uh, have to execute yourself, if that makes sense. Uh, so after he has passed away or put to death, this became known as the year of four emperors. I don't know if many of you have heard it. This happened between 16 and 69 AD. And during the time of Nero, uh, he had something called the Great Fire of Rome, essentially when two-thirds of Rome burned down. And um, people actually believe that he burned the half the city on one half the city down on purpose because he wanted to build himself a massive nice castle. And uh, he actually debased the currency by about two Okay. So essentially, um, Nero actually um, debased the currency by about 10%. So what debasement means is, you know, back in the day, they used to use gold coins or silver coins as a means of buying things and selling things, right? Uh, during times of economic upheaval and political unrest, what they would do is they would essentially mix different types of metals into the coins um, if there was a scarcity. And they would use, for example, silver and copper to mix it with gold, and which would kind of still keep the uh, coin looking kind of gold. And um, we can see at 66, the purity was still nearly at 100%. But then as soon as he got killed, uh, between 16 and 69, did we see a drop, right? Um, this was, the first ruler was Galba, who was the governor of uh, Spain at the time. So essentially, he ruled for, I believe, eight months. Um, actually, I'm double check that. No, seven months. Um, he ruled for seven months, and uh, it was also not it, very economically stable. And uh, after he got overthrown, um, it was a very bloody year, you know, a lot of massacres. Um, I believe Galba, uh, Otto, you know, Otto, Otto came into power, and the currency was the base even more. I mean, now it's at about 82.5%, um gold, and then you have 17% of different kinds of metal junk introduced into it, you know? And um, then we had Vitalius. During Vitalius, you can't really tell uh, what the coinage was like, but as soon as he was overthrown, I believe he was in power for about two months. Um, the currency actually got a lot more stable with Vesalius. Um, and Vesalius's reign actually stabilized the Roman economy a lot more, as you can see, because the purity went up quite a bit. So essentially what this is, is you know how I was talking about how we produce muons? These muons are used to study um, coins. And uh, if the coin was about one millimeter thick, the muon managed to penetrate it at about 0.4 millimeters, which is quite a lot. Um, I was talking to uh, one of the people in the audience yesterday, and he said that's only 40%. And then I said, I mean, if you flip it over again, you actually get about 80%, which is, you know, a decent amount to cover. Essentially, the way uh, muons work is they cascade from uh, orbit to orbit until they hit the nucleus. When they hit the nucleus, they release an X-ray. Uh, 
these x-rays all have different energies. Some are more energetic, some are less energetic. Depending on how powerful the x-ray is, we can determine which um, element it is without, again, having to take apart the body. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of Samson. He was a very important um, character in the um, Bible. And um, there was actually a big statue, but this is the statuette that was constructed by um, uh, the nephew of Da Vinci. And so we have two different images here. We have a neutron radiography and an X-ray radiography. We can tell with the X-ray radiography, we can tell the defects one. But the advantage of neutrons is we can see what repairs were actually done on it, you know, and what material to use. So yeah, these are the um, artifacts I chose to study for today. Um, I want to answer a lot of questions. I want to extend a thank you to these people who have really, really helped me uh, understand the physics, helped me with PowerPoint, and helped me with a lot of the images for today's talk. And yeah, I'd love to answer questions now. <laughs>